Hi folks. <clears throat> In this video, we're going to kind of help ourselves review things that maybe we learned before, or maybe we didn't really get to learn in enough, enough depth yet. We'll walk through um, the answers to the first analytical data sheet that you will have submitted. Uh, don't worry too much about grades for this one. We'll go pretty easy for the first one, since I know we're still all getting back and getting used to this. Um, the first thing that I need to say is, um, I apologize. Um, your analytical data sheets are missing a chemical shift here. That is my fault. I noticed this, you know, two years ago was the last time I taught this class. Um, and I totally forgot to fix it, but it's fixed now. My bad. So how do we go about this analytical data sheet? Probably the most difficult things are going to be looking at the NMR spectra and the IR spectra. The mass spec is really um, a lot of math, right? Can you calculate the mass of a methyl group if it breaks off? Um, stuff along that nature. Really, you just got to know your, your uh, molecular weights and your um, elemental atomic masses. Let's start with NMR. So here in the analytical data sheet, you'll notice that the protons are labeled with letters and the carbons are labeled with numbers. You'll use those letters and numbers as you enter the atom assignment, either for the proton NMR or the carbon NMR. Let's start with the proton NMR. In general, folks, when we're looking at a spectrum, such as proton NMR, when you see peaks that are down here towards zero, those are protons that are shielded. They're shielded by their electrons. That means they have most of the electron density around them. Now we can compare that to peaks that we see over here. We call them D shielded. Peaks that are D shielded are going to be those um, that are, you know, next to electronegative elements such as oxygen, such as nitrogen, such as halogens. So that's your general rule. Things down here, they have their electrons, there's nothing electronegative around them. Things over here, the electron density is being pulled away. What next? The next thing that's probably important for us to think about before we um, jump in to answering this NMR table is understanding uh, multiplicity and the numbers of protons. The number of protons should always be pretty straightforward for you. Here on this NMR spectra, we've given you the number of protons. This peak is one, this peak is one, these peaks represent four protons. This peak represents three protons. Multiplicity might be a little more difficult. I'm gonna zoom in here for a bit on the right. We call peaks either singlets, doublets, triplets, etc. here in the multiplicity column. What does multiplicity tell us? Well, for example, this peak here is a singlet. That tells us that these protons are not next to any other protons. Or, for example, if I zoom in here, you'll see this is a doublet. A doublet means it's next to one other proton or these triplets right here. This means that this proton is next to two others. So this is important information that should help us solve the analytical data sheet. Let's get started. I always like to get started with things kind of on the extremes, either way down here or way down here, because generally for me, they're easiest. Over here, we have three protons 
that have a lot of their electron density, so they're not next to anything that's particularly an electronegative. You'll find methyl groups, very common, over here. So it would be a good assumption that the CH3 protons, or G, match up with these three protons. They're not next to anything particularly electronegative. And there's three of them on a methyl group. What about these two singlet peaks over here? Well, they're at 11.1 and 13.2. We need to find protons that are less next to electronegative atoms, and they're by themselves. Looking at the structure, I can identify two protons that fit the bill. Right here, we have a proton in a hydroxyl, or carboxyl, rather. And then here, we have a proton hydrogen that's bound to a nitrogen. So they're not next to any other hydrogens, right? There's not a hydrogen here, or here, or here. So they're all alone. There's only one of them, and they're next to electronegative atoms. Now we just have to decide between this one and this one, which is next to the oxygen, which is next to the nitrogen. Oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen. So I would say that the oxygen hydrogens here, that is A, so A should be here, and F should be here. Folks, that leaves us with the most complicated part of the proton spectrum. I'm going to zoom in on it. In this region, we generally find our aromatic hydrogens. Here's the aromatic ring that we're focusing on. You see that there's four total hydrogens we need to account for, and there's four total signals here to match. Generally, I don't really need you to go into too much detail about which one is which. I do have a quick note um, for everyone, so let me get that pulled up really quickly. On our website, if you go into content, if you go into handouts, and scroll to the bottom, there is this handout about benzene substituents that can possibly help you if you really go, want to go down into the details. How does this work? Well, if I scroll down to the proton section here, you'll see that any proton coming off of an aromatic ring is going to start at 7.27. Then the rest of this information will help you kind of gauge how much more or less that particular proton should be. Let's start with an example. And let's start with this hydrogen here at B. B is ortho to a carboxyl group. Let's remember that from our starting position, one away is ortho, two away is meta, and across the way, or three away, para. So we are ortho to carboxyl group. Let's go check out the table. Here is our assignment for ortho, and I just need to scroll down until I see COOH. This looks like CO2H, and apologies for the comma. Uh, this is written by someone who's European. The comma should be a decimal. We have a positive 0.77, so we would expect that hydrogen to be 7.27 plus about 0.77. So feel free to use this if you really want to go deep into the details. I do not require that for this class, but I do want to make sure that you match up what we have here as doublets 
or triplets pretty well. So let's talk about that. Here we have B. There is no hydrogen here next to it, but there will be one hydrogen here. So it will be split into a doublet. So for B, you should match it with either this or this peak. So either of these two here. Similarly, E is only next to one hydrogen. It should be the other doublet. Now, what about C and D? They are more or less symmetrical. And you can see that D is next to one, two protons. So it will be a triplet. So you should match C and D with one of the triplet peaks, which is either one of these two signals. So that's how you wanna go about, <coughs> excuse me, the hydrogen NMR. What about carbon? Carbon's a bit more simple and it follows the same general principles. There's no splitting, we don't have to worry about that. Also, each carbon has its own peak. So that's also more straightforward. We just have to align the numbers with the shifts. Same rule applies here, folks. Way on the right, carbons that are in methyl groups, that are not participating in double bonds, that are not next to electronegative atoms. Way on this end, generally are our carbonyl carbons. Those are the most shifted. And then for the rest of the carbons here, uh, we'll generally expect like aromatic or benzene carbons. So let's see what we can do here. Down over here at 24, we should expect the methyl carbon number nine. Then for these two carbons over here, those are generally our carbonyl carbons. So either eight or one. I would probably want us to make the most shifted signal the carbon that's next to not one, but two oxygens. It's probably the furthest downfield. Then this carbon is next to one oxygen and one nitrogen. So it's probably the second peak here. So we've taken care of the methyl and the two carbonyl carbons. That basically just leaves us with the six signals in the benzene ring. Now again, feel free to go to this worksheet. I'll scroll to the top here. And you can do the same types of calculations for benzene carbons. However, I'm generally pretty comfortable um, with you folks just kind of um, doing your best here, right? So, you know, probably you can expect carbons um, to or carbons um, two and three to be maybe a bit more shifted. Um, but really, I'm not worried about getting too much into the details here. Um, I'll basically accept many answers for these aromatic carbons for the proton. No, oh, sorry, for the carbon NMR. So that would be true um, for basically all of these shifts. Do your best. Use the table if you'd like. Normally, um, the table can be pretty helpful. Probably one more note I have to make for the table is uh, this IPSO assignment. So orthometapara, right? IPSO means on the carbon itself. So if we were talking about carbon two here, IPSO would be this carboxyl group coming off. So if we try to find a carboxyl group Here we go. It should be approximately 128 plus 2.9. And we can use this table to kind of help us figure things out. So that is NMR. 
probably the other thing that is most confusing is this IR spectra. And so IR is a little bit different here, right? Here we're talking about like vibrations and twisting of bonds. To me, it's not quite as uh, understandable, not quite as straightforward. And maybe that's also the same for you. So what I like to do is basically work one-on-one -on -one with the IR table. There are peaks that generally appear in more or less the same place. And you probably will come to recognize them over the course of the semester. Let's go to that table. So this is linked in our Blackboard page. And way at the bottom, we have uh, the IR table. A couple of really important things to point out that we'll see a lot of this semester. Generally, around like 1690, 1700 are carbonyl signals. So think, you know, if you see some nice signals around here, around here or so, probably carbonyl. Additionally, something really common we'll see could be a carboxylic acid, OH, or just, you know, the OH bond itself. Generally, that's at like 2,500, 3,000, and it's like really broad, okay? So probably this peak right here. Not this stuff going here, but this stuff right here. What else? Some other common things that we'll see along the way probably are amines. They'll appear a little bit higher. 3,300, 3,500 or so. Uh, and we'll likely see, you know, a lot of carbon-carbon um, bonds, probably something like alkenes, something like aromatic rings. We'll see a lot of that in this class. Those will generally appear kind of in the same area as the um, carbonyl bond will. And so using what's given in this table and what's given in the IR spectra, we'll come to a conclusion. Let's start here. We're pretty high and we're given a big range here. So it's nice and broad. When you see a broad signal, the first thing that you should think of is an OH bond. Likely, this is the OH bond. Now, what's next? This is also pretty high, so we need something pretty high up there. Um, 2909, so we're probably like right about here. And if we look at the table, you know, the other thing besides the OH that's pretty high up is going to be an NH bond. So even though it's not quite in the right you know, range, that's probably a pretty good fit because it's fairly high. What else? Okay, so we have one signal here, two signals here, and one signal here. Now, this two signals might give us a little bit of um, a heads up. So we have a signal at 1646, 1604, 1450, 1578, all in the middle there. I think probably, folks, we need to be focusing on what's going on here with the aromatic stuff. And then probably we need to focus a little bit in on um, the carbonyl signals, OK? So we just need to figure out which is which. Our signals are at 1646. Uh, maybe that's this one. 1604, probably this one. 
1450, probably that one. Uh, 1578, uh, that one's probably 1578, so I think I miscalculated here. But, you know, when we're getting down into the nitty gritty like this, I'll be pretty flexible, right? I'm going to say since we have two signals here, I would probably most likely assign them to the two carbonyl bonds. So I'd probably write the C double, uh, double bond O there. And then probably assign 1646 and 1578 to um, the various aromatic signals we have here. We have a, a weak and a medium. And that's probably um, what I would uh, write down for this analytical specter sheet. Hopefully this video helped you kind of understand how to go about solving these problems and it provides a little bit of review for both NMR and IR spectrometry. Thanks.